Good evening. Good to see everyone out. The uh, next week, uh, be after the evening service, we'll have our card ministry. So be planning on that. And then also, before the evening service at 4.30, uh, be a uh, baby shower for Vicki and Josh Plum, having twin baby boys. So uh, remember that. There's a sign-up sheet on the bulletin board uh, for uh, if you can bring some vegetables and fruit trays on that. And then also next, uh, this Saturday, the 15th, uh, men's breakfast. Uh, Adam said to let him know if you can attend on that. So it's at Johnny's on there. And then uh, Joe Wells, we announced this morning, uh, is in Dexter today through Wednesday night. Uh, so I believe, Jeremy, were you planning to take the bus? Okay, so Jeremy said, if anybody wants to go, be here at 6. And then some updates on our sick list uh, from this morning. Uh, several members had gone up to see Lonnie Holland. Uh, they said he's doing better. He's going to be moved to rehab tomorrow and probably be there for a couple of weeks. Hopefully it's going to be in the hospital uh, they said, but if not, it, he may have to go to a nursing home for his rehab. So need to remember him. He's in room 5004. And then uh, Stephen Wright, we announced this morning, was in the hospital down in Alabama. Uh, Jeremy uh, talked, uh, talked with him this afternoon and said that uh, Stevens has a blood infection probably from the bad gallbladder and uh, doing a blood culture to determine what kind of antibiotics they need to treat it. Uh, he had said that the church has helped him out tremendously uh, on his illness while, uh, while he was down there and said Keith and Dana Sandlin just lived minutes away from the hospital, and they've been taking uh, care of him quite a bit. And uh, so they're waiting on that to see what needs to be done. Uh, Nicole is down there now, uh, so need to continue to pray uh, for Stephen. Those are the updates I have. Does anybody else have anything? Josh. Okay, registered on Amazon then. Okay. Anything else? Good to see Rick's mom and dad out here with us. If you would bow with me this evening. Dear Heavenly Father, we're thankful for this opportunity to gather to meet as your brethren and uh, worship uh, in your name. We're thankful for the presence you have in our life and the guidance you give us every day. We ask that you be with those that were mentioned that aren't as well as they'd like to be, that you would just take care of them and the hands that are attending to them. We ask that as we go through this service tonight that you would uh, open our hearts and our ears to the lessons being brought and, and so that we may apply it as we go through this next week as we interact with others. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Four fifty three will be our first song tonight. Four five three. <clears throat> we'll go ahead and sing. Um, 
We'll sing all three verses. Not a step will I take without Jesus is the vow that my heart has made. Though I often am tempted to leave him, yet unto him my heart is stayed. Not a step will I take not a step without him will I go. He will lead me along to that beautiful home over there. Not a step will I take without Jesus as I travel life's way though temptations may be all around me I will follow my Lord each day not a step will I take not a step without him will I go To that beautiful home over there. Not a step will I take without Jesus. Where he leads I can never stray. From the path that will lead me to glory. To that land of eternal day. Not a step will I take, not a step without him will I go. He will lead me along to that beautiful home over there. If you would like to uh, mark the invitation song, if you're using a book tonight, there'll be 382. 382 will be the invitation song. And then the song before the lesson will be 351, 351. We'll sing both verses. Troublesome times are here, filling men's hearts with fear. Freedom we all hold dear, now is at stake. <clears throat> Humbling your heart to God, saves from the chastening rod. Seek the way, pilgrims trod, Christians awake. Jesus is coming soon, morning or night or noon. Many will meet their doom, trumpets will sound. All of the dead shall rise, righteous meet in the skies, going where no one dies, heavenward bound. Troubles will soon be o'er, happy forevermore. When we meet on that shore, free from all care. <clears throat> Rising up in the skies, telling this world goodbye. Homeward we then will fly, glory to share. Jesus is coming soon, morning or night or noon. Many will meet their doom, trumpets will sound. All of the dead shall rise, righteous meet in the skies, going where no one dies, heavenward bound. Once again, if you'd like to uh, mark that invitation song, it'll be 382, 382.
Good evening. Good to see everyone back this evening. We're going to continue our series tonight on why did my Savior come to earth. Tonight we're going to talk about Jesus bringing a sword. Jesus is a homewrecker. No, no, not in that sense. Usually when we use that word, we think about someone who is having an affair with someone who is married. However, in the process of studying this lesson, I found this definition for homewrecker. It is a person who is blamed for the breakup of a family or a marriage. And if that is true, yes, Jesus can be a homewrecker. Because Jesus, in his ministry, taught this. This is from Luke chapter 12, 51 through 53. Do you think that I have come to give peace on earth? No, I tell you, rather, division. For from now on, in one house, there will be five divided, three against two and two against three. They will be divided, father against son and son against father, mother against daughter and daughter against mother. Mother-in-law against her daughter-in-law, and daughter-in-law against mother-in-law. And then the Gospel of Matthew is recorded in Matthew 10, 34 through 36. And Jesus said this, Do not think that I have come to bring peace to the earth. I have not come to bring peace, but a sword. For I have come to set man against his father, and a daughter against her mother, and a daughter-in-law against her mother-in-law. A person's enemies will be those of his own household. Here Jesus shows us that he didn't come to bring peace, but to bring a sword. Now for us, that doesn't sound much like Jesus, especially because Jesus is known to be the Prince of Peace. Over and over about Jesus in Scripture, we see that he came to bring peace. We see from the book of Zechariah that he prophesied the Messiah would come and speak peace to the nations. We find when Jesus was born that the angel said there in Luke 2 in verse 14, glory to God in the highest on, on earth, peace among those with whom he is pleased. We find Jesus on the Sermon on the Mount speaking in, in Matthew 5 and verse 9, blessed are the peacemakers for they shall be called sons of God. We see that Jesus telling his disciples towards the end of his ministry in John 14, 27, Peace I leave with you. Peace I give to you. And then finally, Paul, speaking about Jesus, says in Ephesians chapter 2 and verse 14, For he himself is our peace, who has made us both one, has broken down the flesh and the dividing wall of hostility. Don't you see the theme? Peace Peace, peace. It's the story of Jesus. It's a story of peace. And most people, on top of that, when we think about Jesus, they associate Christianity with making our families better. One of the most popular seminars that churches offer their community are these family seminars. How to be a better husband. How to be a better wife. How to be a, a better sibling. How to be a better father and mother. How to be a better child. Over and over, it's a stress that we have in, in, in the Bible and in, and in our lives that Christianity should make those relationships better, right? Even me, this last year, I've, I uh, presented a lesson on how Jesus and knowing the life of Jesus should inform and to improve the marriages that we have. Over and over, we see that Christianity is often a, a thing that helps our families, not hurts our families. At least that's how it's often presented. We see many Christian books and Christian organizations that are formed just for the purpose of improving our Christians, Christian families. And so when most people they look at Christianity, they associate that with helping our families keeping our families together, not tearing them apart. Now, as we think about that, as we think about the peace that Jesus offers, as we think about how Christianity should help our families, but also comparing that to what Jesus said about bringing the sword, I want to be clear, I don't think Jesus is contradicting himself here. I don't think it's in conflict with what he has said 
in the scriptures. Because what we see in the Bible is that God does not want to break up our families. We see in the book of 1 Corinthians chapter 7 that Paul is talking about staying in the situation in which you were called. Stay in that situation. And he brings up a variety of situations like slavery. But one of the other ones he he brings up is, is marriage. And he says to the Christian, if you are married to an unbeliever, stay in that marriage. Stay in the status, the situation by which you were called. Jesus doesn't want us to have our families broken up. However, what he is saying, I believe he is saying in these passages in Matthew 10, as well as in Luke chapter 12, is this. And that is, faith be chosen over family. When your family wants you to choose family over faith. It's been several years, but I've told you before about a man named Barak. Barack was someone I came in contact with when I was going in, into college, and, and I, I met him through an association with my, my dorm mom. And what Barack had been through was that he had grown up in the country of Turkey, and he had grown up as a Muslim. But he moved to the United States under a student visa, and he was studying there in Nashville, Tennessee. And as he was, he went to a church one night. And the purpose of him going to that church was to steal something from the church. However, when he got there at the church, he experienced one of the most amazing things in the world. And that was Christians singing in four-part harmony praises to God. And based upon that experience, he stayed after the service. He started meeting people there at the church. And he even started studying the Bible with the preacher. And so eventually he became a Christian there as he was living in Nashville. But then soon he went back home. And he told his parents, he told them that he had converted from the Muslim faith to the Christian faith. And his dad, his dad took a spear and tried to kill him. Okay, that kind of sounds like a King Saul type thing. But he tried to kill him with a spear. And it was at that moment that he realized that he had to choose his faith over his family. If he really believed that Jesus saved him, that that was the most important thing for him to do in his life. Now, I don't know how Barak's story turns out. I haven't kept up with him. I, I have no contact with him anymore. But I think he knew in his heart of hearts, and I believe he's probably... Um, because, of he, because of going through those trials, I believe that he probably is standing firm to this day. Because he understood, I think, in that moment, faith must be chosen over family when your family wants you to choose family over faith. See, the good news, the good news that Jesus came to bring to all of us might be bad news for our family relationships. And the fact of the matter is, is in our society, that is very countercultural. So many times I've heard people say, family is the most important thing. I've heard that so many times. In some ways, our our society has made our families an idol. I know that a lot of you live in this area, not because this is the place where you can get the most money at your job, but the reason that you stay in this area is because of a family. It's important to you. In fact, in our culture, if you miss spending holidays, spending the holidays with your family, that's the worst thing in the world. I haven't heard this here, but I've I've talked to other preachers, and they have mentioned that one of the hard things of bringing people back on Sunday nights and Wednesday nights for services is because people are saying in their congregations, that's our family time, and we want to protect that family, that family time. Their focus is on their family even over and against coming back to church. In our society, family comes first over and against anything. We even have this phrase, right? Blood is thicker than water. And when people quote that line, what they mean is is the blood relationships you have with your family, that's thicker than any other relationship that you might have. The focus is, is that family should be prized over everything in our life. That's what our society is telling us. And I still believe you can prize 
your family. I think you should prize your family. However, what Jesus is trying to communicate here in Luke 12 and Matthew 10 is that Jesus is the priority, not one of your priorities, the priority. See, Jesus, even in his life, he prized his family. In his life, he was submissive to his parents, Luke 2. He made provision for his mother while he was hanging on the cross for John to take care of her after he passed, John 19. And then Paul commands us in 1 Timothy chapter 5 that we are to provide for our families. Our families should be, should be something that we prize, that we nurture, that we, we care for, that we provide for. At the same time, Jesus must come first. Jesus says a little bit later there in Matthew 10, verse 37, Whoever loves father or mother more than me is not worthy of me. And whoever loves son or daughter more than me is not worthy of me. He's saying, I have to come first. If there's something that has to do with your family that conflicts with something that I have said. You choose me every single time because you love me more than anyone or anything in this world. Now, Jesus, by teaching this, his intention was not to break up families. That was not his, his focus, his goal when he came to this earth. But that is sometimes a natural result of following Jesus. And maybe many of you have experienced this in your life, that because of your faith, there are some conflicts in your family over your faith. Or maybe you get made fun of of people in your household because you believe in Jesus. There might be many situations where our faith naturally creates conflicts in our households. It might create conflicts within our marriages. It might make our kids mad at us. There are times that our faith causes this division. By the way, as a side note, I think it's important for those who are not yet married to make the choice not to have this conflict because you still have a choice. If you choose to marry, I want to encourage you to marry a Christian. Marry a Christian. I, I don't want you to have to, to experience that conflict every single Sunday where, you're, where your partner is trying to discourage you from coming to church. I don't want a, a relationship for you where, where you have to, to argue every time you give money to the church. Or that it's a, a consistent conflict between you and your spouse that, that divides you. Now, you want someone in your life that will help you in your walk with God. Someone that will help you to be faithful for the rest of your days. And sometimes we make it harder on ourselves by not marrying a Christian. But I want to encourage you, if you have that, that shot, that chance, if you are still single, marry a Christian. It's a lot easier to stay faithful to God. I know personally, in my life, having that support in my household. However, there might be some of you that are in those relationships where you are at odds with your spouse when it comes to faith. And if that is true, let me encourage you this evening, don't give up on those relationships. Don't give up on those relationships. Yes, the sword of the gospel might divide you for a moment, but it might not divide you forever. And we see that hope in the scriptures. We see that in 1 Corinthians chapter 7. As, as Paul is speaking about staying in this relationship, even with an unbeliever, stay in, in this marriage relationship, even if you don't see it eye to eye on your, on your faith. And this is what he says in verse 12 through 14. To the rest, I say, I, not the Lord, that if a brother has a wife who is an unbeliever, she consents to live with him, he should not divorce her. If any woman has a husband who is an unbeliever and he consents to live with her, she should not divorce him. For, this is the reason, for the unbelieving husband is made holy because of his wife and the unbelieving wife is made holy because of her husband. Otherwise, your children would be unclean. But as it is, they are holy. In other words, you have influence right now. You have influence to, to help your spouse or your kids to be holy. Don't break up your family. Stay in it as much as you possibly can. And then later on in the scriptures in, in 1 Peter chapter 3, verses 1 and 2, the apostle Peter says this, Likewise, wives, be subject to your own husband, so that even if some do not obey the word, so they're unbelievers, 
They may be won without a word by the conduct of their wives when they see your respectful and pure conduct. Here there's hope. There's hope that if you live a godly life, your spouse might be able to see that and then come to the Lord. Now, I still think it's important for us to be consistent constantly in our lives, to be consistent in always choosing your faith over your family. I know that might not make your spouse happy right now, but I think that's what's needed to lead them to the Lord, to show them this is truly the most important thing in the world. So keep being consistent. Don't give in to your spouse. Don't give in to them when they ask you to do something that's against your faith. Be consistent. Show them the gospel. And I think we have many great examples here of that being true, that the faithfulness of one spouse led to the conversion of the other spouse. So don't give up on those relationships. Those things, uh, those relationships can really be used by the Lord to bring people to him. And so, yes, Jesus doesn't have to be a homewrecker. But the sad reality is sometimes he is. Often he is. And in a world that says blood is thicker than water, we as Christians, we need to choose faith over family every single time. We've got to be countercultural. We have to be different. Interestingly enough, with this expression, blood is thicker than water, the original expression was this. The blood of the covenant is thicker than the water of the womb. Did y'all know that? It's pretty cool. The blood of the covenant is thicker than the water of the womb. It's really the opposite of what we have said in our society. What it's saying is when you make a, an agreement with someone, if you make a covenant with them and maybe sealed it with blood, that is more important. That is thicker than your family relationships. And for us who are Christians who have, who have entered a relationship with Jesus because of his blood, because he shed his blood with him, he has shed his blood for us, our covenant with him must take precedent. It must be our priority. Our covenant with Jesus has to be thicker than our blood relatives. It has to be thicker than our relationships with our family. And so let me encourage you this evening as we think about this line, faith must be chosen over family even when your family wants you to choose family over faith. I want you to think about people in your life that you have in your household or maybe in relatively extended family that needs to hear more about your faith. And I want to challenge you this week to go and, and find some way to influence those people. Now, they might not like that. They might not like you inviting them to church. They might not like you sharing your faith with them. They might not like that you're, you're serving them and you're saying, I'm doing this because of my faith. They, they might not like that. But do it anyway, because we must choose faith over family, even when your family wants you to choose family over faith. Let's pray together. Dear God, our Father... We are so thankful, Lord, that we see what must be first in our life by the teachings of Jesus. And he shows us over and over again that our priority must be you. And I pray, Lord, that you will help us as your people to always choose our faith over family, to always choose our faith over anything else in this world. That it's so important that we stay faithful to you, that we love you over anything and anyone in this world. I pray, Lord, that you will give us the courage, that you will give us the perseverance to continue to live that out in our lives, to show others that we truly believe that you come first. I pray, Lord, by us doing that, by us doing that in a respectful and kind way, by us doing that with great determination to follow your will, that other people, even people in our household, will see that, and that they can have the peace that Jesus came to bring by his death on the cross. Help us, Lord. Give us courage to always choose you over and against anything in this world. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Maybe there's someone here this evening that needs to respond to the gospel message, the good news that Jesus came to bring. Yes, it might not be easy. There might be times that you have to choose him over and against people that you love in your life, people that you're closest to. 
but it's worth it to have his blood cleansing you of sin and being in his family, to be in his family now and forever. If someone needs to come to faith tonight by being baptized into Christ, we would love to assist you on that. Or maybe someone needs help and strength in, in a situation in their home. They just want to ask our, our prayers for you in that situation. We would love to help you in that as well. If you have any need, please come forward as we stand and sing this invitation song. seats for you. Lift up your voice, leave with him your care, and begin life anew. Kneel at the cross, leave every care. Kneel at the cross, cross. There is room for all who would his glory share. Bliss there awaits, harm can ne'er befall those who are anchored there. Kneel at the cross, cross. Jesus will meet you there. <clears throat> Kneel at the cross, give your idols up, look unto realms above. Turn not again to life's sparkly cup, Trust always in his love. Kneel at the cross. Leave every care. Kneel at the cross. Jesus will meet you. not able to partake of the uh, Lord's Supper this morning, um, you can go to the door on my right and Ray will help you out with that. Um, we'll, sing, uh, we'll sing 282 for our closing song, uh, just the first and last verse. <clears throat> I know that my Redeemer lives and ever prays for me. I know eternal life He gives from sin and sorrow free. I know, I know that my Redeemer lives. I know. Eternal life He gives. I know, I know that my Redeemer lives. I know that over yonder stands a place prepared for me. A not made with hands most wonderful to see. I know, I know that my Redeemer lives. I know, I know eternal life He gives. I know, I know that my Redeemer
Let's pray together. Holy and righteous Father who art in heaven, we're so thankful, Lord, for this wonderful day that you've given us for the fellowship we could have with one another. And Father, to worship you on this Lord's day. We pray as we gathered around thy table, sang songs of praise unto thee, and, and give to our means, Father, that we have done the things that have been in keeping with your will. Lord, we're especially mindful of those unable to be with us on account of sickness. We pray especially for them that that's in the hospital, Lord. We pray that you'll continue to watch over them and be with the doctors that are working with them, Lord, and, and get them back home where they belong, Lord, and where they can be back here with us. And, Father, we're especially mindful of Jesus as he died upon that cross, we, especially for our sins, Lord. We know that we are all our sinners, and we pray, Lord, that at this time that you'll forgive us for the things that we have in our life that would keep us from going to heaven. Continue to watch over us, Lord. Continue to follow us throughout the week ahead. Be with us, guide, guard, and direct us. These things we ask in Jesus' name. Amen.